All right, so um, thanks for the introduction, Robert. Uh, so at our departmental meeting earlier this week, I called myself an imposter in the restoration seminar series. Um, so I'll try to tell you how I got interested in restoration. But I started out working for my dad as a ranch hand in southeast Montana. This is the Powder River. Uh, and then you have rough terrain all around the Powder River Valley. So the plan for this talk, I'm trying to cram a lot in and I sometimes run out of time, so let's hope that I can get through it. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life before I got into science 20 years ago. Then I'm going to talk about, because I mostly study human health, I'm going to talk uh, very shortly about microbiomes in human health. And then that'll transition nicely into soil food webs and plant health. Then I'm going to go to, into regenerative agriculture, which is a restoration of agricultural land rather than like mining uh, restoration. And then if we have time at the end, I'm just going to do a little plug for this new course that I'm developing called the Biomes Project. Okay, so here is a guy that had a big impact on my life. This is my dad. He's in his happy spot right there. Um, this horse was his favorite. Unfortunately, the horse passed away a few years ago, and I swear my dad was in kind of a depression for a couple years after that. Um, but anyway, here he is. He's in the pickup, and this is my son, Wally. And if you go back 30 years in time, that was me stuck in a pickup, getting driven around the ranch and hearing about cows. OK. So here's a map of the world. This is just one of four maps that is in this article. And what they tried to do is they mapped the different areas of the world where there was degraded land. And so the de this is a kind of a heat map here. And so really degraded land, like in the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. We've got some bad spots around the United States, India's. Amazon, it's all over. So if you like restoration, but you don't stick around Butte to do that, there's tons of land to restore elsewhere in the world. So uh, a, different, a map from a different study showing land degradation, this is from 1990. It's called the Glassod study. And they've put some different types of degradation that was occurring. I kind of cropped this picture so that you could zoom in on what's going on in the United States. A lot of water erosion, a lot of wind erosion, and this is basically you plow up fields enough or you overgraze land enough that you will start to lose land topsoil to erosion. And so we're going to talk about bringing those somewhat eroded, uh, unhealthy soils back to life. Okay, so here's another picture of my dad's ranch. We would have driven over to these cows, and my dad would be like, hey, this cow's awesome, and I'd be like, why is that cow any different than this other cow? And uh, he'd say, well, it's got a straight back. And uh, I, I don't know, does that help it with uh, back problems later in life? I don't know. But anyway, I was terrible at understanding one cow from another. So I mostly drove tractors around. I did a lot of haying in the summer. Uh, and so that, to me, was a lot of fun. And I was just mowing down alfalfa all day long. Now, we talked about cows all the time, but here's a quote from another paper. Soil microorganisms are an integral part of ecosystems, but their activities re receive little recognition in agricultural management strategies. And that's part of what's led to some of these degraded soils. So again, we're going to try to bring this back to healthy soils. So my background is in virology and parasitology of viruses and parasites that infect humans. And so I have always had kind of a human health uh, look at things. About 10 years ago, I got, or 15 years ago, it became obvious that microbiomes are important for the health of humans. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And as long as I'm saying the word microbiome, I figure may maybe I should describe that. A lot of times when people say microbiomes, they just are meaning all of the different microbes in a particular environment at a particular time. That is the microbiome that is occurring there. So what's living there? That's not technically correct. Microbiomes is all the genetic material, all the genes that are being expressed in a situation. Microbiota would maybe be a better word. but. Uh, lots and lots of people use the wrong word, and so I'll probably end up using the wrong word just 
going to point that out real quick. Okay, so March 2005 issue of Science. I was in my first year of grad school and um, I had a free subscription to Science. We didn't have the internet, we didn't have smartphones, and so I would read Science front to back every month. And this particular issue caught my eye. Uh, I thought it had a clever title, The Gut, Inner Tube of Life. And um, the first article in this uh, issue had this quote, the average adult human is, in essence, a 10 meter long tube. The inner lining of this tube, the gut, absorbs nutrients and defends against would-be pathogens. Yet the number of microorganisms it accepts and even embraces is higher than the number of cells making up our entire body. Um, so it used to be said that there's about 10 bacteria, archaea cells for every human cell that you have. Um, more studies been done and it's almost an equal number so it might be how long it's been since you've been to the restroom, whether you're more you or more bacteria. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so I thought that this was fascinating and in, when I was in grad school we, um, we had a journal club where each student, each grad student would pick a paper, send it out to all the other grad students, and then you'd talk about that paper. I picked out a paper that had to do with mice. Now in human health studies, we use mice a lot because trying to uh, mess with humans is kind of hard to get past all the IRBs and stuff like that, so it's easier to do some experiments in mice. So this is a typical lab mouse, mus musculus. It's probably a Balb C mouse or some other mouse like that because it's white and we have black mice, so we have white and black mice. Anyway, the, the main point is we learn about what's going on with, say, the microbiome of the mouse and then we try to apply it to human health. In this study that I had picked out for um, grad school, uh, they had taken some mice and they were using what's, what are called germ-free mice. These are mice that completely lack any uh, bacteria or other uh, microbes in their system. If you have a mouse that's pregnant and you do a cesarean section and you take the pup out and you keep it in a sterile environment, you can keep those mice, uh, by, by doing the C-section you're avoiding the birth canal which was where animals can pick up some, some bacteria. You can maintain germ-free mice. Now, these mice have no bacteria, uh, hopefully on them, and especially in them, in their gut tract, and this leads to some pretty messed up mice by not having any microbes in their stomach. And one of the things that gets messed up is the immune system. So they were studying these mice and they were saying, hey, this immune system is just totally messed up compared to our wild type normal mice. And they gave this mouse well, maybe not this particular mouse, but a mouse uh, identical to this one. Uh, uh, they gave it just one type of bacteria, a bacillus of some sort, I can't remember more than that off the top of my head, and it restored these major defects in the mouse's immune system, just one type of bacteria. Now, um, you know that there's lots and lots of different type of bacteria in a gut, and uh, the general theme is that the more diversity you have, the healthier you are. But just a single bacteria restored the mouse's immune system. On top of that, they found a particular uh, molecule called polysaccharide A that made up a coat of this bacteria. They fed that to the mice and the mouse's immune system just with this one type of polysaccharide had the major uh, improvement in their immunology health. And so that was 15 years ago and since then we've been keep making additional links between the microbiome, microbiota and the human health. And so we we're just talking about immunity. Uh, another interesting study, they took mice that were germ free and um, they uh, in inoculated them with um, uh, feces from overweight people or feces from normal weight people, and the mice that got the feces from overweight people, they ended up not having any changes in their eating behaviors, but they ended up gaining more weight than the mice that got the feces uh, inoculated into them from skinny, skinnier people. 
And so that's just another really uh, famous example of how this microbiome can really affect your, um, your biology. And uh, anyway, uh, I want to talk about soil, so I'm going to move on. But this is, this is why I got into uh, soil microbiomes, is that I was following all this literature as it was coming out. Okay, so the new naturalist. So here is a scientist sitting in a computer, and there's this never-ending line of microbes here. Uh, if you wanted to study the microbes in your gut, you'd have a tough time doing it just doing cultures because a lot of these are anaerobic bacteria. They don't, we don't know the right culturing conditions. And so for a long time, even though we had plenty of material available, we didn't know what those bacteria were. But now we can do DNA sequencing and figure out what all bacteria and other organisms are in the gut. And so the cost of DNA sequencing has been coming down um, super fast and we're now able to, they first started with the Human Microbiome Project and then they went on to, um, the, the recent one was the Earth Soil Microbiome Project and they took like thousands of samples from around the earth um, and sequenced all the bacteria that they could find in there. And so now we're getting a pretty good idea of just the diversity. We still can't grow them, but we at least know they're there, and we can figure out like what, what ratios they are in this soil versus that soil. So we can take, we can take a head count, but uh, uh, it's the other, um, exactly who's doing what in the, in the system is not terribly well understood. So the take home message from all this microbiome stuff is that uh, I'd like to caution you, we're finding correlations and much less causations when, between microbial communities and a given observation is in its infancy. We can say, hey, you have this sort of observation and at that time you had this sort of microbiota living in that situation. Uh, maybe they correlate with each other, uh, but we, it's, it, Again, it's in its infancy. So this is a if if you're interested in a cutting edge of science, this is would be a, a place that you might think about doing some studies. Now, some of the specifics are being worked out, but this is happening slowly. So you've got your microbiota here. They use the, actually the right word, um, and they show that in the gut, the microbiota is interacting with the immune system. Here's that PSA, the uh, polysaccharide A that I mentioned earlier, uh, LPS, the different, different molecules from the, the bacteria. Uh, TMA, this is a metabolite if you eat red meat. A number of metabolic reactions can happen, and this TMA can have a negative effect on your uh, heart health. And so there's some cautions being thrown out about too much red meat and it being negative against heart health. Don't tell my dad, because he loves his cows. Um, again, it's either things shed off the, of the micro, microbiome or microbiota, or it's like small metabolites that are interacting, and that's kind of the way that these things are, are working. Um, again, I kind of said this before, but the general theme, the more diverse your microbiomes are, and it directly correlates with improved health of the person uh, or the mouse or whatever animal you're talking about. However, we're going to switch over to talking about soil food webs and the diversity again is uh, the general pattern is the more diverse microbiome or microbiota you have in the soil, the healthier your, your plants uh, will be. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. So every year in my evolution course, maybe, I don't know, I don't see any in here, but uh, we read this essay. It's written by Theodosius Dobzhansky, and it's called Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. And it's kind of long, and uh, uh, it's starting to show its age a little bit, but um, it's, a, it's a great way to think about things. So let's think about land plants uh, and uh, soil uh, in an evolutionary perspective. So three and a half billion years ago, 350 million or 3,500 million years ago, we might have had some bacteria, archaea, 
uh, hanging around, and if you have those, then you probably have some viruses that infect those as well, called bacteriophage or archaeophage. And uh, so they've got all these interactions between these three things. Pretty soon, eukaryotes came into existence, you know, pretty soon, 3.5 billion years ago versus 1.8 billion years ago. Eukaryotes finally made the scene. And uh, then the, some of the first ones might be things like protists. And so then the protists are interacting with these. And uh, I know of some protists that are, you know, protists are single cell, but there, I know of some studies where they show that if there's a certain type of bacteria around, these single cell protists will form these clumps called rosettes, and they start acting more in a, uh, uh, combined fashion or they're they're working together as a community to work and so so protists come in and now you got protists archaea bacteria and bacteriophage you also have viruses that infect protists but you could say viruses for everything um, then pretty soon a billion years ago fungus made the scene and we started having fungus interacting with the protists, with the archaea, with the bacteria and all that. So but by the time we had green plants and especially land, green land plants, there the earth was just covered in germs, uh, little creepy crawlies. And so it makes sense that the plants would also interact with this huge network of uh, organisms in the soil. All right, but you can't just say soil organisms are microbiota. We can split up our soil into different sectors, okay? So this yellow part coming down here is supposed to represent a root. And there are some bacteria, some fungi and, and others that live within the root, and that's the endosphere. Then there's an area surrounding the root where there's really high numbers of bacteria and that's called the rhizosphere. And then when you get away from the root a little bit, now we're just gonna say soil. So we've got soil versus rhizosphere versus endosphere, microbiomes or microbiota. Um, anyway, so just remember there's lots of different, and if you have a different type of plant, the microorganisms that associate with its roots might be different than that first plant you were talking about. Okay. I. I at first, I loaded up this talk with all sorts of laboratory studies where they were under, starting to understand how these roots are interacting with the microbiota, and uh, I've had a, I had a fear that I was going to get bogged down in that, so I, I, I narrowed it down to my favorite one. Uh, I do a lot of things with fluorescent molecules in my lab, fluorescent proteins, so I think it, they're pretty awesome. And then what we have here, this is a Petri dish. It's divided into three areas, and this study was looking at metabolite exchange. So they had some phosphorus here that had some uh, molecules surrounding each phosphorus that were red, and over here they put some phosphorus where the molecules around each phosphorus uh, phosphate group uh, were surrounded in cyan color. And then you can see up here, this is uh, roots from a carrot. And what you can't see, because they're too thin, are fungal hyphae leading from, if, if, you, if this picture was a little clearer, you can kind of pick up on a hint of that. But there's fungal hyphae leading from these, th these micronutrients, like phosphorus, back to the root hairs of the, the carrot. And what you see is that way over here, where the carrot roots are, they are, it doesn't, it doesn't come out as well on here because never nothing ever does. But there's patches of red, uh, red and cyan uh, here. And in this study, they're trying to understand. For example, the roots might give off some sugars to make friends with the fungi, and then the fungi uh, then go over and pick up some phosphorus. So the fo the phosphorus is being handed off to the root hairs uh, by the fungi, and then the fungi are uh, or then the root hairs are giving off sugars to the fungus. And so maybe it's a mutualistic relationship. But this is in a, a marketplace, and in the article they talked about, we don't really know if this is more of a parasitic one or if there's all sorts of competition going on. Um, there's, anyway, 
I just thought it was awesome that you could zoom in. Here, you actually, they've zoomed in far enough, you can see those fungal hyphae, and these are those colored phosphoruses, and you can see them traveling uh, up the fungal hyphae on their way over to the carrot roots. Um, so that's as nerdy into that exchange as I'm going to get, but you can imagine all sorts of things in the soil, all sorts of micronutrients are, might be brought to the plant through these microorganisms and the plant might give off some things to the microorganisms in exchange. Okay. So that Toby Kears is the, was the author of that, and she has this quote here. It says, doesn't it strike you as odd? We know so much about other types of networks, and this is undoubtedly the most important network for our ecosystems. She might be biased. But we just don't know anything about it. It's radically understudied. So if you're looking for a career in research, uh, this is a good, a good area. How are the soil microbes interacting with the plant roots. And so what we have here, this is a plant root and it, a lot of plant tissue is just autofluorescent so it glows nice and green. And then here you have fungal cells with some hyphae coming out from them with their, what is what these thin layers are. And it was stained with a particular type of stain that I just <coughs> ordered and I have in my lab now so we can look for fungus in uh, uh, in this biomes project that I'm talking, I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Okay. Are there any questions? I feel like I've just been plowing through because I wanted to get through everything. We're good. Bacteria are there. There's lots to learn. All right. So regenerative agriculture. So this is the idea that conventional agriculture uh, practices over the last 100, 150 years have really led to a lot of problems with our soil health. For example, I just came from Iowa before I moved to Butte, and they say in Iowa that they've lost about half of the topsoil in that state due to erosion. Okay, so regenerative agriculture would be the idea of trying to reverse that trend of losing our topsoil. Okay, so I'm sure that in some restoration seminars or, or classes you guys have talked about succession, but I just want to run, run through it real briefly here. So let's say you had an ice age and the glacier melted back and you're left with bare rocks. Pretty soon some lichen come along and you have the lichen breaking down some of the rock material and some weathering from the rain and ice and cold and all that to the point where you start to get a little bit of topsoil. Okay, the first things that are going to live in this are going to be small annual plants and lichens. Okay, and we're talking about hundreds of years for this process to happen. Then after those small annual plants you might get grasses and some perennials, then it moves on to grasses, shrubs, and shade intolerant trees, and then finally shade tolerant trees. So your forest becomes mature. So you go from low, small annuals through kind of some bushes and trees into a, and so that is the succession as you go through that. And again, it takes hundreds of years. In the restoration projects around here, we're trying to get to this area where you've got the perennials and grasses and shrubs and uh, trees that were native to this area, right? So we're trying to get over here. You can have things that happen that set back the, uh, the plant environment some, like a big forest that burns down and then the timeline here is rapidly sped up because we do already have some soil to work with and pretty soon you've got your annual plants and your grasses and perennials and those pioneer species give way to your more native intermediate species and, and, your, and your trees. So the timeline very much sped up here. Here was the fire, here are the ashes on the ground and so you can see the ashes here there's a layer and you build up topsoil on top of that and so you're building, you're building soil. So with regenerative agriculture the question is can we, can we use our smarts to speed this process, process up after some sort of major disturbance. So 
going back to us going the wrong way with our soil health, we, a lot of it can be uh, blamed on the plow. So we have not tilled soil here versus tilled soil. You've got nice topsoil. The ground is dark. There's a lot of things called humic acids, and, uh, and so this soil is called humus. Um, and there's worms in here. You have subsoil below that that's breaking down and giving way to topsoil. You come through with a plow, you get a huge increase in cellular respiration, and the bacteria are super happy for a little bit until they kind of use up all that stored up humic acid. So that, that dark material here is kind of like a battery, and then you just are like draining the battery super fast when you, when you uh, till, the, till the land. And so air is coming in in the form of oxygen, it's coming out in the form of CO2, those are just cellular respiration like crazy. You, you lose some of that soil organic matter and compaction starts to happen, and then erosion can happen, and then you just totally lose your soil structure. And so uh, when I was growing up, I spent two weeks creating a new field, and I was so proud of it, and I, had, I, I spent two, three weeks straight plowing, and I'm just thinking how much my <laughs> CO2 I was releasing. And, and it, that field that I made, it's gone back to just pasture land, so all that CO2 is released, and now it's probably worse land than when it before I got to it. Anyway, a, another aspect of conventional agriculture that can lead to poor soil health is that it fails to mimic natural systems. So over here we've got an agricultural system. We've got all, pl all plants of the same type. They're roughly the same height. They all have leaf structure that's approximately the same. And so your diversity from plant species to leaf traits are low. Then the root types, if they're all the same types of plants, you have all the same types of roots. And so then those roots interacting with the bacteria that are in your soil uh, is going to cause a decrease in the biodiversity and you can have negative, this PSF is basically just uh, soil microbes interacting with the roots and whether it's a positive interaction or a negative interaction. And so they're saying here that when you start to lose diversity, you start to lose your ability to have some positive relationships there. Over here in a natural system, you have plants of different height. You have plants of different colors of, of green. Uh, you have plants that are short and round leaves and triangle leaves or diamond leaves. You get the point. But then you also have uh, grass or plants that have uh, long roots, others have like a tap root, others, so lots of different root types, lots of different microbes might be interacting with those roots, and so then you have a high diversity of, of microbiota, okay? And so regenerative agriculture, there's lots of different uh, definitions of regenerative agriculture, but I went to regenerativeagriculturedefinition.com to, to bring you this uh, definition, so it's got to be right. Regenerative agriculture is a system of farming principles and practices that increases biodiversity, enriches soils, improves watersheds, and enhances ecosystem services. So that was that previous slide showing you all the diversity in plants, all the diversity in the microbes, better soil health, and so all these things are positively enhanced if you try to do these things, or at least that's the theory. By capturing carbon in the soil and abo above ground biomass, regenerative agriculture aims to reverse global climate change. At the same time, it offers increased yields, resilience to climate instability, and higher health and vitality for farming communities. So that's a lot of promises there, so I just want to take a second to say that by having all this increased organic matter in the soil, it is actually a carbon sink. And so for all these years, we've been doing all this plowing and losing topsoil. We've been releasing plenty of CO2 into the air. And one way to help soak up that CO2 from the air is to improve the soil health, OK? Um, so that's where that whole global climate change comes in. 
uh, increased yields, resilience to climate instability. Some areas are supposed to be hotter or colder in the future. Some areas are supposed to have more rain or less rain in the future. But if you have healthy soils, those can help retain moisture or soak up a heavy rain event or things like that. And then uh, health, health in the communities, I think they're referring to uh, herbicides and pesticides. You have reduced need for inputs if you have an ecosystem with a big diversity. Okay, and the system draws from dec decades of scientific and applied research by the global communities of organic farming, agroecology, holistic grazing, and agroforestry. So I started off talking about uh, uh, cows at the beginning of this talk, and mostly I'm focusing on crops in this, in, uh, or, or plants uh, in this. But uh, I'll give you an example. When I, back home, our main part of the ranch was close to 20,000 acres, and then we had part of the ranch that was another 20,000 acres. Now this is eastern Montana and you can't grow too many cows on that many acres, so it's not as big as it, or it is as big as it sounds, but it's not as uh, wonderful as it sounds. But we had our part where we had our summer pasture, it was 18,000 acres and it was split into just three pastures. And we would take our cows out there at the beginning of the summer and maybe once during the summer we would move them to a new pasture. So they just kind of went around and they went around and they would eat their favorite food and then they uh, ignored all the things they didn't like and so it would end up hurting the biodiversity. And so I, I just don't have time to really get into it but there's a whole lot of ideas on how to move animals around so that you can have uh, improve the soil as well. Okay, I have a concern with all this regenerative marketing and I just don't think it's going to play well in middle America. Their strategy is terrible. Here, here is also from the regenerativeagriculturedefinition.com website. Uh, progressively improve whole agroecosystems. You need to avoid the word progressive if you're going to be out in eastern Montana where I was. <laughs> uh, create context specific designs and make holistic decisions that express the essence of each farm. If I went back to my hometown and talked about the essence of their ranches, they would, they would uh, think I really sold out. Um, then we have reciprocal relationships among stakeholders and we have uh, continually grow and evolve, oh, get rid of that word, uh, individual farms and communities with their innate potential. So this is just not going to fly. So I have a better idea. Have you heard this quote, leave it better than you found it? Robert Baden Powell, anybody know where that comes from? Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts, that's the Boy Scout rule. Leave it better than you found it. So this would play a lot better um, back in eastern Montana where I'm from the idea that you want to improve your land. Do a few changes on the way that you work your land so that it gets better over time. I think that's, that, would, that would go over well for marketing. Now, I'm a scientist, so if I wanted to write some grants to talk about regenerative agriculture and come into this at some point, I need to come up with some marketing and I can't talk about the Boy Scouts or uh, hippie type stuff. Um, and so, We've got the soil ecological engineering is one term that I found and maybe you think I made that up, but here is an entire complex graph talking about soil ecological engineering. It actually does a really good job of getting across the point that I want to make and it is confusing so I'm going to take just a little bit of time here to run, run across this. Uh, so we have yield level, so how much uh, productivity are we getting out of the land, okay? We have low yield versus really high yield, and so that is this line here, and as you cross a certain threshold and start messing with the environment, you can improve the amount of yield you get from your land, okay? And so at this end, it's really intensive agriculture and at this end it's natural processes, natural systems, okay? And the idea here is that in our current 
conventional agriculture systems, we're throwing down fertilizers, we're throwing down all sorts of inputs, uh, and we're, we're trying to get as much yield as possible from each acre of land. And so that requires tons of external inputs. A lot of these inputs, like the fertilizers, are energy intensive to make. We converted factories from World War I, World War II that were involved in making ammonia to make bombs. Uh, we now, we changed them to being <coughs> factories that make ammonia that we can put down with our seeds when we plant in the spring. And uh, it's, it uses a process called the uh, Haber-Brosch. Haber yeah, Haber-Bosch process, and it's just very energy intensive to get that, okay? So in the middle here is where the sustainable system comes in. The idea is, can we improve the yield without a reliance on these external inputs, okay? And what underlies this improvement in yield in the land without the ex uh, external inputs we have fewer natural processes because we as humans are getting involved and we're doing our soil ecological engineering bit, okay? So I'm gonna uh, describe a few different soil ecological engineering processes that you can use in regenerative agriculture that can help increase your soil without having it be these uh, synthetic inputs, okay? If you didn't like that graph, here's a separate way of looking at it. Extensive, so in a natural system, you have high soil biodiversity, you have not too much inputs, it's just whatever's naturally coming into the system. You have this circle here is supposed to be the biodiversity of the soil, so it's a large biodiversity. You have a little bit of yield and a little bit of uh, material going into upgrading the soil. Okay, so it's a slow process, but there's lots of different organisms involved in this process. At the other end of the system, you've got ex intensive systems. This is where you're putting huge amounts of inputs into the soil and huge amounts of yield coming out, but the soil biodiversity is small and it's a thin uh, arrows here to, to try to explain that you just don't have much in the way of diversity going on. Somewhere in the middle, we take the good parts of this and the good parts of that, and we have a sustainable system through ecological intensification. And that is where you are enhancing the uh, diversity by making sure that you don't just have your crops, you have other things growing in the soil too, so that they're putting things into the soil. You have different root types, different leaf types, uh, different microbes in the soil because of this and so we've got our wide array of diversity here and we have a decent yield and a decent improvement of the soil um, and without this this was uh, inputs external inputs this is the system the ecosystem itself making molecules that help improve the soil what should you like better you like uh, this one or this one? Is that which one was that cheering for? <laughs> okay, so two two graphs trying to show two visuals trying to explain the same thing. I'm not sure which is better. Uh, okay, moving on. So how do we nurture the food webs? Well, we want organic matter to get into the soil because the soil organic matter is what helps improve soils. And so the number one, uh, first source we're gonna talk about is mulch. You could bring in mulch from uh, out, outside the environment or if you're in a forest, the trees are constantly shedding their branches and leaves and stuff and creating forest litter, okay? I have a garden at my house that I actually just brought in a bunch of mulch and I laid it on top of some really terrible soil and it's taken a couple years but I'm getting some really nice healthy plants. These mulch is breaking down, it's feeding the food web, there's all sorts of things in the food, insects, protozoa, bacteria, fungi, other insects and my favorite worms. Um, I have worms growing up in my office right now. 
Anyway, so that's what's happening. What happens if you put 100 grams of mulch on the soil? Okay, so here's a little diagram of that. The vast majority of it's going to end up going off into the air. You're going to have CO2 release. That mulch is going to be broken down. You have cellular respiration going on uh, with the microbes in the soil. And so you're going to have these uh, mostly carbon dioxide, maybe some methane being released off into the air. Depending on the conditions, maybe around 5% of the uh, mulch is going to end up being living organisms. Some of it is going, maybe 5% will be dead organisms. There is a turnover of or, microorganisms in the soil at any given time. And then the third category they call very dead. Those are those humic compounds I was talking about that give you that, that humus, uh, the soil with the dark brown uh, culture. Okay, And then you'll also get some energy and nutrients out of the system. So we're trying to we're trying to get to this very dead stuff to try to build up that soil make the soil better okay i had this figure already again but the organic matter source number two is plant exudates if you have plants uh, they're going to be doing photosynthesis up above ground and they're going to be sending those sugars below ground and that's going to feed the soil food web. So you don't necessarily have to bring mulch in from somewhere else or you don't need to have the trees that are constantly raining the litter down. You, the plants themselves can bring some uh, organic matter into the soil. So here's examples of pictures of cover crops. Uh, here it mostly looks like they don't have too diverse of a cover crop, but this yellow here was the crop that they harvested and they went back through their uh, cropland and they planted cover crops so that they have plants growing there even after you collected your harvest. This is just a, a picture showing different leaf types, different uh, monocots and dicots. These would have different root types as well. And so uh, there's kind of getting a push. There, it's it's kind of like that more diversity is better. And so whenever I'm, I'm reading about cover crops, it seems like more and more are being added to the mix. And so uh, I'm, I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about my biomes project, but uh, we have clover. Uh, as a cover crop that we're going to test out in my biomes project this year. And we also have a 13 seed mix of uh, cover crops. And we're going to grow in my lab that I have this fall, uh, Discover Biology Lab. We are growing herbs in an indoor agriculture system. And we're going to see if our cover crops can help out our, our herbs. Uh, maybe I'll come back in a year and tell you about my cover crop indoor agriculture adventure. Okay, and then finally, if you want the soil to be healthy, it, it, takes, it takes some water, okay? And so you can improve uh, water absorption if you can improve that soil organic matter, but there's other things you can do. You can artificially create ponds and dams and swales. This is uh, a system where they've got, a, you can see a lot of the, um, a lot of these ridges or swales are going along the contour of hillsides and they're trying to they're trying to slow down the rate at which the water lands on the land and then exits the land and so anything you can do to improve that um, I, I talked bad about tilling earlier I just want to point out that this is a plow but it is a different kind of plow than like uh, when I made the field for uh, back in the day uh, this is called a subsoiler, and there's different names for it, but this one has just a relatively few number of spikes that go down into the ground, and they will go down 12 to 24 inches into the ground, and they are called subsoilers because they, uh, a lot of times, you will have the topsoil and then the subsoil, and then the, the interaction between those two layers isn't very good. This just drags a, a plow blade through that subsoil and creates some mixing between those two layers and it can speed up uh, the formation of topsoil. It can also help with your absorption of water into the system. Um, Gabe Brown is a farmer out of Lydia. <laughs> Uh, out of Fargo, and uh, he's famous for regenerative agriculture. He has his dirt to soil rules that I was going to just run through real quickly. Um, 
Reduce and eliminate soil disturbance. So don't do tillage that's just that top part of the soil and you're going to get rid of all your humic acids and stuff. Pesticides and herbicides, they're supposed to be active against uh, uh, insects, of course, but there are insects in the soil food web that you are going to be killing off. And then herbicides are supposed to be active against specific types of plants, but these can also kill all those microbes living in the soil as well. So try to reduce those if you can. And then keep the soil covered throughout the year. So we talked about mulching and cover crops. Crimping is just a different method where you have this really heavy roller behind your tractor that um, is kind of like a giant rolling pin, but it's got little blades on it, and you just bring that over the top of your grasses, and it knocks the grass over, and it causes crimping of the, the grass blades. And this is kind of an artificial, uh, when you, I skipped over the part about the cows helping out the soil, but when a cow munches on uh, a stem, the roots die back a little bit, so you, you, get, you damage the top of the plant and the roots will die back. And it's kind of a, the roots will, is, if you think about root health, there's kind of a, it's kind of like two steps forward, your roots grow, and then you have an animal come in and chew on it, or you do this crimping, and then the roots die back, but that feeds more of the soil microbes, and then it kind of sets the stage for two steps forward again. So it's this idea of kind of a repetitive two steps forward, one step back to get, uh, and then mowing, of course, you just mow it down and, and all of that's sitting on top. And that is protecting, raindrops aren't gonna hit the soil and cause uh, the loss of your soil structure. Have green plants growing as much of the year as possible. Use as many different types of plants. So I've kind of covered some of these already. And then uh, have some sort of animal impact cycling your nutrients. Um, and I just kind of talked about that as well. Are there any questions on any of these five before I move on? I see that we're pretty much out of time, so I'm going to skip through the biomes part of this. As much as I'd love to tell you about my pet project, um, I'll skip it. And yeah. I also had some reading recommendations. Uh, I have all sorts of books you can read if you want. Um, here's that Gabe Brown that I just mentioned, Dirt to Soil. Uh, this guy, David Montgomery, has written many books. Uh, the Wizard and the Prophet, this is a great book. It compares um, the life of William Vogt, which was kind of the original environmentalist sort of agriculture person versus uh, Mark, um, who's the Green Revolution guy? I'll think of it. You know the Green Revolution in the, in the 60s and 70s where we got all sorts of extra yield? Okay, anyway, that compares the life of those. I read, it's like a 500 page book, you think I could remember, um, and then some more. Anyway, I'll just, before I ask you for questions, I'll leave you with, with this question. Could we use these regenerative agriculture practices and use them to speed up restoration projects around Butte? For example, what I was thinking is, here's Butte after mining, and then here's where we want to get, and can we speed up this timeline if we take kind of a sidestep into regenerative agriculture practices with the idea that we're preparing the soil for the native plants to be much healthier once we try to get the native plants established. So that's, that's my question to you. Thank you. All right, I'm out of time. <laughs>